We made it. Can yeah. you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I didn't so realize just that. To respect it, your time, how much time do I have with you today? An hour. Okay, perfect. And is there anything particularly that you want me to stay away from, or it's completely open book? Anything you want. Awesome. Okay, let me go live. I'll push live on this, and then we will hit go. And sometimes I have issues with mat with technology, but I've been told that that's a sign that magic is around when that happens. So I take that as an omen. Okay, I think it worked. Perfect. Yeah, it says live, live on Facebook. Nice. <laughs> I'm actually impressed with myself. I did not think that would work. Amazing. So welcome, welcome to another episode of the Flow Protocols. Thank you so much, everybody, for streaming in. On today's episode, I am actually bubbling inside. I'm giddy with excitement because I have a special guest that has completely transformed my life, and he doesn't even know it. So I'm a big fan of this, this man. His name is Dr. Dean Radin. He is the chief scientists at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. He has written and co-authored so many books on the subjects of consciousness, magic, alchemy. Uh, Dean, I first discovered you through a podcast episode. I don't actually know which one it was because I've heard you once say you've had like 600 interviews or something of the likes, <laughs> but mm -hmm. This was the episode that made me go, huh, because you had mentioned something on the interview around how the majority of the population have experienced or believe in sort of psychic paranormal, paranormal experiences, but yet only, I think it was 0.3% or something like that of academic scientific uh, the world was dedicated to exploring this space. So there was a huge gap happening there. A lot of that because of the stigma that has been around with the world of uh, magic and alchemy, how it wasn't even considered a real science for a really long time. In many ways, it was sort of anthropological studies. So we are, that was the episode that really connected me and made me go, ah, man, okay, this is interesting discussion. And then I went and picked up Real Magic, which I highly recommend every listener goes and picks up a copy. It is phenomenal. What I really loved about this book was how you described how a lot of the concepts of esotericism has been in so much repackaged nowadays under terms of manifestation and law of attraction and these hype mm -hmm. words. So pretty much we're all doing magic and alchemy, but we just are, st it's still so stigmatized that we've like, we're, we're performing it or we're consuming it under these new terms and, and, words, if you will. And that's when I, I really opened my heart to magic. And I realized, oh, shoot, this practice has been around for a really, really long time. And it permeates almost every aspect, every religion, every mindfulness practice. These ideas have been practiced by our ancestors for centuries and centuries. So I first want to start off by just saying a deep, heartfelt thank you. Thank you for being this ripple of consciousness in a world that is so stubborn with a lot of beliefs and ideas and for continuing the work that you do, because I know for me personally, it has had, I mean, connecting those ideas and allowing myself, because that's what you did, the science. I need my rational minded needed a scientist to tell me like, it's okay, Kat, you can believe in these things. Because before that, it was too much woohoo. And you were the one that made me go, okay, yeah, I, I can open my heart to this. And it's changed my life. It's completely changed my life. So thank you so much. And I'm so excited to have you here on this episode. 
to start off with, uh, why don't you, for the listeners, just explain what your definition of magic is? So magic is, uh, it's a practice based on a worldview. So the analogy I like to use is that our technologies today, like the, the technology that is allowing us to do this webinar is a practice based on the scientific worldview. Magic is a practice based on the esoteric worldview. And in that sense, it really is a very close correlation because the technology is an application of the way that we perceive the world, how we think it works. Well, magic is that too. Magic is an application of a somewhat different worldview. And as I describe in Real Magic and many other places, the esoteric worldview in many ways is more comprehensive than the materialistic worldview, which is the one of, of current day science. So magic incorporates science, even though most scientists would not agree with that at all. Nevertheless, I think that is actually a, a way of thinking about what, you know, the word esoteric means hidden, mm. you know, the exoteric world, which is out there and the exoteric, uh, esoteric world, which is hidden but it's never been hidden. It, it's always present and it's present in different ways and you can't get rid of it, which is one of the reasons why when you look at the entertainment world, some very large percentage, maybe 30% or 40% of entertainment, which means fiction and movies and television shows are all about esoteric concepts. Yeah. Marvel you know, comics has huge themes all of, it. of this. Yeah. Huge. Theme. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask you a question. So you, you said that uh, learning that there's a rational way of thinking about these phenomena, which there is, even rational from a, a Western and scientific perspective, why would that have changed? How, because you, you clearly have a natural ability, which must have been around forever, but were you doubting that that was even real? So I un unknowingly was practicing forms of magic when I was doing sexual transmutation, as I'd read that from Napoleon Hill many, many years ago, but I didn't realize this was a, essentially a form of sex magic. So it's the same thing that happened to me, honestly, with meditation and mindfulness. And I've heard you say before how when we believe something, it's just the hardest thing to see beyond it. It's just the shell that we're in and it takes a few generations to die. And it's much the same way as maybe female equality and meditation and mindfulness, where that was kind of a joke 30 years ago and psychedelics. And yet now we're starting to go, oh, wait a second, there's something here. And the naysayers that sounded crazy back then are now being trumpeted as these heroes, but I, it feels like that's where we're at with magic at that phase of consciousness, just starting to realize it. But the mass majority of people are still very much like, no, this is, you know, child's play this. I think a lot of us interpret magic as a rabbit being pulled out of a hat or some kind of gimmick of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's not too surprising uh, that the way that magic is portrayed, especially in the entertainment world, is usually in, as a horror theme. That's the way that these shows devolve. There are a couple of, yeah. of examples that are not like that, but most of it is horrific. Mm. And I think what that's doing is reflecting partially that it's, it's an unknown for most people, so that people are afraid of the unknown. But it's worse than that because uh, just take one example of telepathy, for example. Uh, the idea that somebody could know what you're feeling or thinking uh, without the ordinary senses for most people is frightening. Mm. You know, like we, we think we're, we have a sovereignty of our own thoughts in here and that's not completely true. And so that's, that's frightening because think about how government would work and how economics would work and even interpersonal relationships. It wouldn't work too well if there were no secrets at a telepathic level or clairvoyance or whatever. So there's a lot of both conscious and unconscious resistance to the idea that some of these things are true. What makes it even worse is if you find somebody who has a natural talent who can do these things more or less consciously, they become a threat. 
So it's not too surprising that historically that people who are known for having these kinds of abilities became targets and many were wiped out. Mm. So and for those, the whole those... monotheistic religion, sorry, didn't help with this, you know, a lot of fear. A lot of people fear their intuition. They fear these natural skills. This, these even yeah. gut feelings that they have. They don't know how to trust it. Right. So then, so, so as you mentioned, part of the, the theocratic control of this is to simply declare anything which is not sanctified by whatever religion is, happens to be in charge at the time is demonic. So that's yet another form of fear that you separate the world into good and evil, and this then becomes evil unless you happen to be a priest or anointed in some way, and then it's okay. So the, the best example I can think of is in Catholicism that the Eucharist, the ceremony of the Eucharist is explicitly a magical ceremony. Mm -hmm. Outside of the confounds of the Catholic church, it would be considered heretical or worse, but it's exactly the same thing. Coming from the mysteries, right? The Greek mysteries or rooting from there. Well, coming from, uh, from shamanism, ultimately, mm -hmm. from as yeah. far back as human history. Yeah. So I'm a very confident individual. I, I, I've never been shy about speaking my truth and declaring who I am. And something so interesting happened when I began. I read your book. I started doing rituals. I started doing Gnosis at home. I experienced tremendous results. It radically redefined my life. And, and yet I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't come, I couldn't come out, if you will. I still couldn't come out. And I hid this for a really long time from my audience and, and clients and people that worked with me, although clients could start to see, I was telling them to do some weird stuff. And that's when I started to realize, I think I'm going to have to like be honest, but there was so much fear just in me, in, in this stigma, this idea that I'm going to get laughed out of the room. No one's going to take me seriously. That will be the end of my business. I'll I'll lose all the money, all the followers I've spent years building. This was really a fear that I had, but something so interesting actually. And yes, when I did come out, I 100% received a lot of, I'm sure well-intentioned, but you're going to hell, be careful of your soul and all of these things. And who are you? But I was also shocked at how many people reached out or also expressed like, yeah, I believe in this too. It was a lot more than I thought. Clients, people running multi-million dollar companies that I never in a million years would expect them to be into this stuff, just confessing. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that there is a shift happening within the academic scientific community? Are we on that threshold now? Well, the, as you pointed out earlier, that the, the number of academics who are known for having an interest in these topics is 0.1%, which mm -hmm. means that 99.9% .9 would deny having any interest. But as you also mentioned, the surveys, anonymous surveys, show that among scientists and engineers, that 99% or 94% have, have experienced at least one thing that they would consider to be psychic. And on average, eight of 25 different kinds of psychic things. Mm. They don't talk about it for exactly the, the same reasons that you're concerned about talking about it because it's perceived as being weird somehow. And the reason why it's perceived as weird is because science does not yet have an explanation. But when it comes to, to people who are successful in business and entertainment and science as well, many privately would admit that they do something. They're using these skills in one way or the other because it works, but mm. they have the same concerns about admitting it. I've heard this myself from many people who are very either famous in their domain or very successful in business. So they look like a normal business person. And then when they have a difficult decision to make, they'll get a little pendulum and go in the closet and do some kind of ritual and get an answer. And more, more often than that, and it looks mad, it. right? But it's, yeah. it works. So they yeah. don't want anybody to see that, but you know, these, these things are, they're real yeah. and it works. So, 
but you're right in that what's really funny is we've normalized magic to such an extent because technology is essentially a way of using wavelengths in this invisible non-physical world and magic is technically the definition of creating crafting change physical change from that non-physical and we're the ones who created the technology so therefore we're inherently even more magical than the devices we invent but it's yeah. so normalized it's so in our face all the time that we're just almost blind to it right yeah well if you talk to to if you read the the lives of or you talk to people who are famous inventors almost all of them will admit at some point that this was an intuition right they didn't they may not know all the details about how something's going to work but they go with intuition and sometimes magical things happen and they create things. So it's true that, so here's, here's an iPhone. So if you ask the, the average person, how does this actually work? You don't have any idea how it works. I mean, some people will know, like I, I have a background in electrical engineering. I sort of know how pieces of it work, but they've crammed more into this than all of the computers in the world 40 years ago. So, it, no one person probably knows all of it now, but we take it for granted because mm. it works. Well, it's, at some point, I don't know when this is going to happen, but there is a significant shift that is happening in, in the academic world, and you're beginning to see it change a little bit in the, in the media as well, largely because of the rise of interest in consciousness as, a, as an object of study. So as you mentioned, 30 years ago, people were laughing at meditation and you know the, the, anything that wasn't completely mundane was laughed at. Well, now you know that we, we've come some, some distance because me meditation is covered by health insurance, among other things, because it works. It's a, it's a matter of pragmatism. And we're learning more and more about that. At the same time, we're learning more about how psychedelics can be very successful applications. All of that is beginning to open up some of the previous resistance about talking about things having to do with what consciousness can do. Mm -hmm. Now, a large chunk of that is what we call magic because we don't have another word for it yet. Eventually we will have a word or mm -hmm. we'll have a whole bunch of words, which are going towards explanations as to how the three different kinds of magic actually work. You know, so we're not there yet, but we little glimmerings of maybe ways of understanding how they work. Yeah, I so want to come back only to one those... so far. We only have one. Sorry, sorry. No, no, you mentioned only one kind of magic, mm, which was force of will. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, so we're going to loop back to those three types of magic that you talk about in real magic. Uh, again, thank you for being one of those people that are having these discussions in this crucial time and it's you know when you look at how we have so many conveniences more than we've ever had before in the history of mankind and yet we're a society deeply depressed and you look at what our ancestors did in, in conditions that were arguably a thousand times more difficult to bear than today the difference in, in the practice or their, or, or their ideas of dominion over their reality, I think it holds a really big secret in terms of finding that space of fulfillment and well-being as a creative being of consciousness, whatever is going on. And you sometimes talk about how we're kind of on this thousand mile race right now of really getting to understand what is really happening with reality, with magic. And maybe we've only taken four kilometers so far. We're, we're very, very early in the stage. And it might take many, many generations to die before we have a, a better complete picture. And when Real Magic was published, that was in 2018, where a lot of what you spoke about was grounded in quantum. Um, but recently, you've spoken a bit about how it seems to be patterned information, or this seems to be a theme coming through. What is kind of the structure that magic exists within? What, what is sort of the concept of reality that, that uh, you are sort of modeling all of this stuff from now? Where are we at with that? Yeah. Well, when, when you look at the esoteric traditions, uh, all of them come down to a certain philosophy, the philosophy of idealism, in which consciousness is considered to be the fundamental thing in the universe. 
and the physical world somehow emerges out of that. So that that's what I, I that book, by the way, is largely about philosophy because it's really all about what do you think reality is? It's the in philosophy, that's the discipline of metaphysics, not metaphysics in a popular sense, but in a philosophical sense. What is reality? And when you know that, there are things you can do that you otherwise would not be able to do too well. So my current thinking is, uh, while idealism as a philosophy is is an ancient one, I think from a modern perspective, what I've been moving toward is called dual aspect monism. So dualism is the idea from Descartes back in the 1700s where uh, the idea was that clearly mind and matter are two different things. External world is matter, but we have this internal world, which is not physical, but it's there. In fact, it's the only thing that we actually know firsthand is, is our mind. So Descartes had this idea then that, that are, you have mind and you have matter and they're different. They're both fundamental, but they're different, which raised the problem and then, well, how do they interact? If you have two things that are so different, there's no way they can interact. So most scientists today do not agree with dualism. Rather, we go towards monism, which is the assumption that there is one underlying substance, in quotes, from which everything arises. So that is kind of like idealism. Idealism says there's one substance, which is consciousness, and that creates the world. And when you look at the esoteric traditions, everything from the Kabbalah to Hermeticism to Neoplatonism, all of them, they all basically are, are, are based on that assumption, which is why magic works, among other things. Mm -hmm. A dual aspect monism. Monism is the notion that there's one thing. Dual aspect says that from that one thing, which Carl Jung called the undus mundus, the one world, from that emerges two things. One is consciousness or mind, and the other is matter. And the reason why this has certain appeal from a scientific perspective is because we know a fair amount about the way that the physical world works. Like it allowed us to make this technology and lots of others. And it's still continuing to be an extremely successful way of understanding how the physical world works. You chop it up in little pieces, which is what science does. Science means to cut, mm -hmm. cut up the physical world. You can learn all kinds of interesting things. It doesn't tell us anything at this point about why do we have subjective experience or about consciousness. That's like the major puzzle in science today. So dual aspect monism says, well, that's because consciousness arises out of this unus mundus, whatever that is, and it actually is different from the, from the material world, but they're tightly coupled because they're arising out of a common source. So the, the metaphor then is, it's like a coin where the heads and tails on the same coin are tightly related to each other, but they're not the same. The heads is not the tails. They have different characteristics, but the coupling of it is one of the reasons why if you take it, you can do uh, brain activated computers now because of the tight coupling between consciousness and neural correlates of consciousness. So that, is, that, that relationship in brain mind has given rise to the idea in the neurosciences that consciousness emerges from the brain. Mm -hmm. That's an inference. It's an inference that the brain is the thing that's doing it. Whereas from dual aspect monism, you say, no, the correlation is there, but it's not, one's not causing the other. They're coming out of something else. So the downside of dual aspect monism is that we're, we're, we're sort of setting aside, where's the ultimate reality? And we're setting it aside because we have no idea how to even begin to think about that. Right? We don't have any direct contact with it, except maybe very deep meditative states and maybe some magical ritual states involving gnosis. Like mm -hmm. that's the place where everything is emerging. From an everyday language perspective and everyday living, that sounds crazy. But nevertheless, that's what all of the wisdom traditions tell us. And the reason why it's relevant now is because you, you have classical physics and relativistic physics and quantum physics. And what is beginning to be seen as more fundamental than quantum mechanics is quantum information theory. Mm -hmm. so this is going back to what you said about information. It looks as though maybe unus mundus is information. It's from information arises matter. And from that also arises mind. Mm. So we're beginning to get glimpses that 
as best as we can tell, a fundamental reality really is about information. Mm. So what's information? Information are patterns that have meaning. So there's two things there. One is that you the, the patterns are things we sort of understand when you do a computer program, you're programming bits and so on. The second element is meaning. If you have information without meaning, it doesn't do anything. And so the, the example I like to use there is, I will convey some information to you where the amount of force and energy in two different conditions is exactly the same, but the meaning is completely different. So I will whisper into your ear, I love you. Or I will whisper into your ear with exactly the same amount of energy and everything else, you're going to prison. So it's the meaning that's, that is different in, this, in the patterns here, and that's, that gives rise to completely different responses. So take that idea and cast it into the world at large, and it kind of looks like, since we're talking about magic, that the reason why magic works is because there's a different informational content which is emerging into this world, to the everyday world, and that gives rise to different things. Mm, this is so interesting. It's almost as if consciousness is maybe uses matter to experience itself or its complementary forces is kind of the model, the, the duality, the yin and the yang. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I love this, by the way, this is... <laughs> getting getting really deep into those levels of, of consciousness. So patterned information. Okay, just a question on this. You've done studies around divination, uh, individuals who have psychic abilities, and you've tested whether it is fated or whether they were perceiving a probability. If we're talking about quantum information, could it not be uh that is this what's happening they're basically tapping into this patterned information everywhere well maybe right i mean if if information is at bottom somehow then we're made out of information too mm -hmm. so we may have direct access to whatever world that is see the, the language begins to fail the moment you're, you're stepping away from the everyday and so we, we can only point at what we're talking about. We can't really talk about it in detail because we don't know what that is yet. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to remind people that I, I will talk in, in metaphors and analogies and don't look at my hand, look where I'm pointing, because that's about as close as we can get right now. And for those I know who are very long-term meditators and people with some genuine magical skills, you ask them, what do you think is going on? How does this work? They have no idea, right? It becomes a, a skill that guess, you can right? exercise. Yeah. <laughs> they know what to do. Like they know how to make a sigil and they know how to do rituals and all that stuff. And it works well enough for them. But diving below that and coming out with now, I'm going to give you a presentation of exactly how all this works. Nobody knows that. Mm-hmm. Mm. So the idea that uh, matter and consciousness coexist, complementary, but I guess magic is the concept that consciousness can affect, can change, can alter that matter, that material, that physical world. So is this the idea that consciousness forms the material world? Is this kind of where you're leaning with things? Like well, how a, Robert yeah. Anton talks about reality tunnels and our perspectives yeah. and our, our, our beliefs and our consciousness forms our experience? Well, that, that's, as I said, that's what I talked about in Real Magic. So this book is basically a book about idealism and the consequences of idealism. So that might be correct. I mean, there, there's many people today who are making the argument that the only thing that you will ever know is your own subjective awareness and everything else is an inference, including all of our models about the way the physical world works. Everything is an inference. The danger of some idealism in this is solipsism. You begin to, real, to think after a while that the only thing that's real is you. Everything else is an illusion. Well, that's probably not real either. Right, So there is some real physical stuff out there. If it's arising out of consciousness, then who's consciousness? 
Well, the answer would be all of ours, plus a whole bunch of additional com consciousnesses, universal consciousness and animals and plants and everything else. So it's a large uh, collective that is, that is creating all of this. That would be from an idealistic perspective. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I'm, I'm beginning to move more in the direction of dual aspect monism where the physical world really is a thing. Once it's, once it's established, it has its own laws. It works in a certain way. It is reliable, which is why we're able to make things work physically, but it is still correlated with mind. So the difference here is that from an idealistic perspective, your mind makes things happen. It's the causality, the arrow of causality is out. Dual aspect monism says uh, you can sort of make things happen, but really it's a, it's a, uh, a correlation. So to think of this in, as like in the following. So when we have a synchronicity, it is a meaningful correlate, it's a meaningful coincidence. Something happens, but it's meaningful to you. So that feels magical. Like I needed something and suddenly it shows up. Well, it, it's a correlation, but it's a meaningful correlation. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why I'm reading this book, Dual Aspect Monism, mm. The Deep Structure of Meaning, because it's meaning that connects the two. And, and so I'm, I'm in the process of thinking about writing a follow-up book on practical magic, which goes more into like setting aside how we think things work. This is these are the processes that you would use and then you make it happen. But I'm also, but I'm continuing to be interested in as a scientist, how does that happen? Well, if meaning is the actual coupling between mind and matter, in this case, you need to dive down deep into some unus mundus third world something with a sense of meaning that you want a correlation to arise that is meaningful. So you could do force of will with that. You can't do it from an ordinary state, but you could maybe from samadhi or a gnosis state because the meaning is arising from down there, metaphorically. Like it's mm -hmm. not really down there. It's, you know, somewhere else. But it, 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 once it begins to arise, it will arise and create synchronicities, which are exactly the ones that you wanted to, to show up. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I, I'm thinking of it now. Mm. So force of will is one of the types of magics. Do you want to explain the other two types of magics that you talk about in ma uh, real magic? So the, the other one is divination. Mm -hmm. So divination is any form of perception that transcends space and time. So the stereotype is looking into a crystal ball or a reflective pool or throwing the runes or I Ching or all those methods. So that's divination. The reason why that would, would work from a magical perspective is again, if we go back to idealism as a, a way of thinking about things, if consciousness is more fundamental than the physical world, then it means it's before concepts of the physical world, including space, time, energy, and matter. So time is in there and space is in there. It means that there, the awareness comes before space and time. That allows us to essentially experience through space, which would be clairvoyance or time, which is either precognition or retrocognition. So that sort of makes, I mean, it's sort of a, as I say, a hand-waving explanation at this point. Mm -hmm. So then the third category, we already mentioned force of will, the third category is theurgy. So theurgy from a classical magical perspective is all about spirits. It's the assumption that there are non-human or maybe once human forms that are still out there somehow. Most people can't see them or interact with them, but people called mediums can. Uh, and a lot of magical rituals were about evoking them to get them to do something on your behalf. So those are the three categories. And there's, as you well know, there are books of grimoires that have thousands of spells in them on all of those different categories. Uh, I have a grimoire back here somewhere. Oh, a, nice. A couple of really big ones. I don't know where I put so, it. So uh, Theoji could potentially also be patterned information. Somebody has sensitivities yes. to patterned information, and it's not a spirit at all or an entity. It's just residual information. That is exactly right. So there, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, psychics can go into a place and feel that the place 
either had something had happened there or it's, it doesn't feel good or they can clear it, all of those kinds of concepts, which actually does make, to me, it makes more sense as an informational effect rather than an energetic that is somehow impressed into the, into the walls or something. Mm -hmm. So I think in a lot of cases of hauntings that that's what's going on, that the, somehow the information gets absorbed into the space itself and that's what people can feel. Wow. Yeah. So force of will, the way I interpret that is very much like enchantment, which is, you know, we do the spells, the affirmations, we set the intentions. And what you're saying is, and you've done studies on this as well, showing that, yes, this actually works. It, it enhances probabilities, maybe just a little bit. Have you done studies around setting intentions or force of will in NASA states versus not NASA states? Uh, not exactly. The closest has been with meditators and non-meditators. Mm -hmm. So, and we see in general, we see better results in meditators, but I, I think the easy way of explaining that is not that they're going into a Gnostic state or they're not going into Samadhi. Rather, they're able to pay attention to, to the instructions and then do it, right? These are mostly mental tasks. So if you're trained to be able to focus your mind, you can simply be a lot better at doing a task that requires focused attention. I mean, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. Whereas we know from EEG studies that mind wandering is happening all the time. So if you have a trained meditator and you tell them to focus on that, whatever that happens to be, they can do it sometimes pretty long, like 30 seconds, maybe a minute, and then they will mind wander. It's mm -hmm. inevitable. If you take somebody who has never meditated and you ask them to pay very close attention to that thing over there, they can do it for about five seconds. And then they're thinking about cheeseburgers. <laughs> so it, it's very difficult, even for people with long, long periods of training to maintain the kind of attention that's necessary to do this, which is one of the reasons why methods like sigils are good, because you, you put focus concentration to create it, and then you have it. And the thing can remind you because your yeah. mind wanders and oh, oh, there it is again. So it, it's simply a way of bringing it, bringing the idea back again and again. It, the way that I view it is that when I'm making a sigil, I'm, I'm essentially entering a state of flow, which has been shown to be, uh, to, uh, to reduce cognitive controls. It puts you in the present moment. So it literally captivates your attention. It pulls your focus in. Whereas yeah. meditating for me, for somebody who has a million tabs open, a million ideas at once, I had to use the Muse meditation device to teach myself how to meditate because it was just the most frustrating thing on the planet trying to do it. Yeah, I have one. Just on my I own, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, you have one too. Oh, yeah. this is a good well, plug for well, them. We should ask for royalties yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> We're actually... Uh, we're collaborating with the oh, company nice. that makes views. Oh, I uh, love that. So that we can, mm -hmm. we can do experiments. We, we, you know, you go to the Muse site and there'll be a place where you sign up for an experiment, which would show up in your Muse app. And then you do an experiment with the Muse on. We would get the data from whatever that experiment was. And it'll allow us to do what we're thinking of as kind of citizen science. Nice. So we'll do an experiment where we can either have the person buy a muse at a discount or we send them one and then we get the data from that. So it's a way for us to expand out the, the subject population to the world as yeah. opposed to having bring somebody into the lab. Yes, because trying to replicate synchronicities or these events in a lab, I can imagine is just a whole different layer. Uh, but, and that's, even... but, but that is exactly what we do. When mm -hmm. we do an experiment in the laboratory on any form of psychic fill in the blank. It's an exercise in creating a synchronicity, which sounds like a, it's a contradiction in terms. We're right. creating a coincidence yeah. that is meaningful, maybe to the subject, but definitely meaningful to us. Yeah. Right. So it's, we're, it's an exercise in creating a synchronicity from a slightly different perspective. That's a magical act mm -hmm. where we're asking people to do something, which is somewhat non-ordinary but they do it and, and it works. So yeah, we're, we're, this is one of the reasons why I, I decided to write this book on real magic because my colleagues were a little dubious about it because we're scientists and we're not magicians until I realized one day that, that no, if you think about what 
what we do in an experiment testing psychic phenomena of any type, it really is, a, it's a, a controlled exercise in synchronicity. And, and it does, you know, it, it, it works well enough so that we know that certain things are real. It doesn't work anywhere near as good as in the real world where there's real meaning involved because not always, but a lot of psychic events involve very strong meaning. Like you can't mm. fake it kind of meeting. That's where you get this monstrous stuff. So we're doing the, the as close as we can get in the laboratory. And we know that it works. Mm. Yeah, my own experiences and outcomes of magic are somewhat difficult to share or with others because they're so non-linear and they sometimes cross time. And when you talk about it to somebody else, they're just like, well, that's a fun coincidence. And it's so meaningless to them, but for me. Yeah. And so that goes back to meaning what you're saying. There's such power in meaning. So when we're doing force of will and setting intentions and essentially uh, what you described as pulling ourselves from the present into that future probability to enhance mm -hmm. those odds. I know you're familiar with the work of Peter Carroll, and he often says divine short enchant long, because mm -hmm. how much of that is just us enchanting that very situation? Yeah, we, we, it's, that's a very, that's a, I didn't, I didn't recognize that quote, but that's a good quote from Peter Carroll. Uh, so I'll tell you a synchronicity. So, uh, I'm, I'm also, among other things, I'm a chairman of a biotech company. And so we're, we're creating new kinds of psychiatric um, compounds. Uh, so we, you go through different uh, rate fundraising aspects of a business. So we're still at the startup stage and we, we did a big seed round where we raised a lot of money to do the kind of work we need to do. So we agreed, the, the C-suite and our investors agreed that we would do kind of a ritual around the closing of the seed round, because we're all kind of on the same wavelength here that we know, you know, a lot of this is science and materialism, whatever, but there's more than that. And we all agree that there's more. So, okay. So our ritual was that we're all located in different places. Uh, we use DocuSign to, to, to sign electronically the, the documents that will close the round. So we all agreed we would do this, this ritual where we would all keep our fingers poised over the computer or the phone to press the button to sign it. Well, I happened to be driving at the time. My wife was actually driving and I was looking at the phone, getting ready to do this. And just as I had my finger over the DocuSign button, my wife says, oh, look at that. And what she saw was this. So this, uh, this okay. interpreters have faith, yeah. right? So this was relevant because of the timing, it was literally right when my finger was about to press the button and doing this kind of funding and doing the, the, the business that we're doing and all the rest of it is a matter of faith. We're having, we have to have faith that this is gonna work because we put a lot of our time and money into it. So that's an interesting synchronicity. Mm. And, it, and it was a coincidence, right? There happened to be a car right at that moment going on the highway that was just passing us that had, had a sign like literally a sign, which is the one that, that was useful at the time because they saw that and said, oh, okay. And then I hit the button. So we yeah. have the money. Yeah. So, it, but then when you say it to other people, they're like, uh, but for you, it's like, wow, that was a message for me. I received that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, and that's the other people involved in, in the same ritual, yeah. they agreed yeah. that it, it was like perfect timing because after all, we're going for multiple millions of dollars, which is yeah. not that easy to raise. Uh, and so some of it has to do with faith. You think, I mean, this is not religious faith. This is, this is more, more like your intention is so much in alignment, but you have to also agree that it would work because yeah. the, the doubt doubt will kill it. In, Belief, in yeah. Because you were saying, if you want to match a probability of a desired intent or outcome, if, if it's unlikely to happen, meaning if there's no path of least resistance for that money to come through, or if you don't believe that, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, so you almost have to match the, the, the end result as closely as possible in many ways to enchant with, that. With, without becoming delusional. 
That's the key. <laughs> and I, I, this is where I struggle with magic is that I do think you need a little bit of insanity to do this. <laughs> Provided you can turn it on and off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So del- like purely delusional means that you can't tell the difference anymore between what's real and what's not real. So a really good magician is very well grounded. Right. The, the, you know, the image sometimes is a, like an eccentric, crazy person. No, it's it's being well grounded at exactly the same time that your head can be in the clouds, both at the yeah. same time, which is why it's difficult to do. So here's another story. So sometimes I say that uh, we're talking about affirmations and how very strong belief and rituals and blah, 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 you can make things happen. So let's say I wanted to have a gold-plated Mercedes just show up in my driveway and I, it's mine somehow. It comes from somewhere. I don't care where it comes from, but it's now my gold-plated Mercedes. So I said this in, in an interview and I know that one of the people watching is a witch. And, and so uh, she said, well, you know, you, you have to be very clear when you make an affirmation of exactly what it is that you want. And so she sent me a gold plated Mercedes, this one, because I wasn't clear on how, like I wanted a real car, not a little model car. It actually is a Mercedes, but a little gold plated Mercedes. So this this is a good reminder to me that the, the act of manifesting something, the clearer it is of what you're asking, the more likely it is that the probabilities will get pushed. Yeah. So in this case, it wasn't completely clear, but I still got to go play to Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like people who say I want more money and then they find a dollar on the street. Not really what they were meaning, but that's technically yeah. more money. It's, it's more a money. dollar more. And yeah. this is I've started to through my work with magic, I've started to observe that consciousness or the universe or source or whatever we want to call it seems to have a literal sense of humor like very literal sense of humor. It's like, oh, you asked for this man with this, 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 here you go. But he doesn't have intelligence. You didn't ask for that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. So there, there it is. Yeah. (laughs) It's true. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, it's before the fact, it's not always so easy to know all the time. There are lots of fables about this, of asking for this, this, and this, and you get it. And Ooh, it was, that's not what I wanted. Too bad. You got it now. (laughs) Yeah. Invocation. This has been one of the beautiful practices of of alchemy that I've adopted. And I wasn't realizing that I was doing that before because it was packaged under uh, law of attraction, manifestation, feel the end result, which is essentially a a, a practice of invocation of feeling, behaving, acting, to such an extent that you're almost confused when you're faced with the reality that doesn't match the one you created in your mind. And then suddenly, bam, you match that probability. And I found that to be the fastest way to obtain what I desire with minimum chaos in my life to calibrate Mm -hmm. to that. But you're right. It requires a small amount of insanity because you're basically... I'm rich. I'm happy. I'm so full of love and you've got bills and you're poor and there's like people knocking on the door and it looks crazy from the outside. It looks completely yeah. irrational. Yeah. Yeah. And so sustaining the groundedness and the craziness at the same time is necessary, but difficult. Mm. So I, I have a story in real magic, which was very much like this, that the, this, this is the story where we had an office and we had to move it somewhere. So we moved it to this other place. And we, we eventually found out to make a long story short, that right next to us, yeah. there was another group doing psychic research. So the way I discovered this was I kept walking past that, uh, that door and looking for somebody inside. Cause I was just going to introduce myself because on their door, it said PsyQuest labs, but we were doing cyber search and their name was PsyQuest thinking, well, that's a funny coincidence. So eventually some, I see somebody in there and knock on the door. The guy comes over, he opens the door and he looks like he's going to have a heart attack. He's really shocked. And later I learned that the reason is that he had been spending the, the whole previous day, 24 hours doing a Tibetan dream yoga exercise where you're awake for three hours and then you sleep for three hours, always holding the intention of what you want to manifest. And the reason you do this strange alternation is to get into the state that you're kind of mentioning here where you're a little bit nutty. You can't tell, you can't clearly tell the difference between a dream and reality. Well, his intention was for me to show up 
He had no idea where I was. He, he knew me before my books, but he wanted me literally to show up. So I knock on the door, he opens the door and there I am. So that's why he was, he was really shocked. And when he told me what he had been doing, we were both shocked because I thought that what I thought it was had free will. I was just going there, but he, he called me in some way, or we, we called each other in some strange way. And, and so he manifested me as he wished. And I manifested the laboratory that he had, which is what I wanted right wow. next to each other. Yeah. So, so it's true that uh, I, I wasn't in any particular altered state, but he definitely was. Mm. So we both were freaked out for a while. So maybe if you're on the same vibration, if you will, it's like a magnetism. The two of you were in this, the two dimensions were colliding or whatever is happening and you attracted yeah. each other. It served each other. I purpose. used the metaphor of a gravitational pull. Yeah. Right? So yeah. That you, when you, you have a, a desire for something, you almost imagine that there, there's, you're in, you're in a, a planetary system and things are revolving around you. That pull begins to change the shape. It distorts, distorts the shape of the probabilities around you. And if it's, if it just so happens that somebody else has a similar pull, you'll begin to rotate around each other and eventually collide. Hmm. So the collision, I think in many cases, is what happens when people have a synchronicity that involves two or more people, hmm. which happens. You know, you're like one time we're in the middle of nowhere in Australia and ran into somebody that we knew who we had no idea they're gonna be there. But, you know, what are you doing here? Well, it's, that's a little bit like that, that things get pulled together and becomes meaningful. Yeah. I like how you talk about, so one of the things that I've started to do is to always write down these synchronicities whenever they happen. All the mm -hmm. magic conjurings I do, any synchronicity, because even dreams, if I remember, though I'm bad with that, but because I forget. And you've once compared grimoires as just what scientists do anyways, when they keep records of their science and grimoires, mm -hmm the same thing. And in this way, it makes so much sense because singularly, it's so easy to write these events off and be like, ah, oh. but then when you start to go through all the things that happened and you collect it in one space, you almost have a, your own little research paper going on. Yeah. Well, th this is one of the things that uh, Peter Carroll spoke about quite a bit is to keep a record, a journal of everything you do, because some of it won't work. And that's just as important as the ones who that do work. Mm -hmm. And for each person, it'll be slightly different. So for you, your rituals will, will work fabulously well. If I try to do it, it might not work at all because maybe we don't have the same meaning or context or whatever. So that's why it's true that a personal journal is really important in, mm. in uh, making recipes that work for you. And grounding yourself to believing it and to, to remembering it. Yeah, remembering yeah. too. So I, when this synchronicity happened between me and the person who made me show up, I wrote that down that day because I knew I, I, there's no way in the world I was going to remember all of the details. So when I put this in the book, I was referring back to the notes of what actually happened almost in real time from, from that event. I love it. So when you first started your career, you mentioned you had never had psychic experiences as a child. It wasn't something you were just academically curious. And obviously now you're doing rituals and you're so was that your studies that made you a complete convert or did you believe in it as you started these this this research that you went into? I did experiments for five years before I convinced myself that there was something worth studying. Oh, wow. So, so you didn't necessarily believe it for five years of doing it. Yeah. No, I was and remain very skeptical about all of this stuff because partially that's simply what a scientist does. You have to remain skeptical because if you don't and you publish something in particular or give a talk, somebody will, will rip it to shreds. You know, you didn't think of this, you did this wrong and they still get that a lot. Uh, it, it is, it's valuable to get that kind of feedback because what you're, what, what you could miss if you completely believe it is things that actually were coincidence or, or worse were mistakes that you, that as you mentioned earlier on, that once you begin to believe something, it creates blinders. You know, you, you can only see that after a while. So 
the reason why skepticism is so important in science is because you want to avoid this kind of blinkering effect. Mm. And it's also valuable that when you get a lot of feedback coming back from colleagues, what you hope is that it's constructive feedback, but sometimes it's not. People are attacking you. It's still valuable because you're able to see what you're doing from somebody else's perspective. Mm -hmm. That would be just as valuable in magic, magical practice because it's so easy to dive down the rabbit hole and then kind of forget to get back up again. So having doing uh, something that we can, we can say critical magic or skeptical magic even, I think that that would be the way of remaining, <laughs> having yeah. one foot on the ground while the other foot can be off in some other universe. So you're a skeptical magician, a skeptical alchemist. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important <laughs> to be. Yeah. So leading on to that, you, your next book, you're thinking of doing something around practical magic. I would love to hear what are, what is, a, do you have a practice? Are there th favorite modes of Gnosis that you personally have, or do you keep it very PG-13 at home? I, I don't do rituals in the sense that if you read books on, especially esoteric or ritual magic, with the robes and the wands and everything. Well, I have those, but at the same token, I also have a very large collection of magic tricks. It's part of, like, part of what I need to know is how do you fake this stuff? So I have that simply as part of the, the equivalent of literature. I have things, I have a magic wand specially made and I have a bunch of things like that. Uh, but as I look back then uh, over my career, I think I don't use those. I don't, I don't need to do rituals. That I, I've ingrained something about the nature of intention so that I've learned if I'm very, very clear on what my intention is, that will happen. It's happened again and again in so many different circumstances, some of which are, are mind-blowing synchronicities. Uh, others are relatively minor, but nevertheless, it happens. So that tells me I don't need the robes and the wand and everything else. I don't need that for some reason because it, I just do it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't work so well in a book on practical magic because people who may not have such experience want to know, well, what did you do? Just do know, it, I, period, the end. Yeah, you, you do, <laughs> it's, like, it's like Yoda would say, there is no try. Yeah. There's do or not do. Just do it, yeah. Well. That's easy to say, but if you're if you're beginning with all this, yes, there you can talk about sigils and writing magic and lots of other things. Mm -hmm. So I'll put that in as as part of it. But uh, part of the concept then in practical magic is also to revise your sense of what is real, as you were saying early on. That once you get a even a glimpse that this is rational, and then I'm not diving off the edge into delusion, that alone will make a giant difference in terms of the effectiveness of what you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, chaos magic was probably the closest practice to what I've landed with, although my mm -hmm. mine is still very different. And I always saw the robes and the wands and the rituals as a way to enchant myself the drumming and the music as a way to deepen belief. It's a way to sort of hypnotize myself, but I don't need those necessarily but they support that sort of objective of recreating circuits of beliefs within right. myself yeah right but and it's and just us it's consciousness doing it it can be very important in the beginning mm -hmm. right it's a way of pushing yourself of of learning how to switch out of everyday awareness into something else which is that close like it's always there but after a while you don't need to do all of that. So the, the an analogy here is uh, I work with some psychics who are exceptionally talented. And so I thought, you know, they're going to do a remote viewing now. They're doing it live and they're you know going to watch it happen. And, and so they just sit down, they do it, and then they're done. So I think, well, then you have to prepare or meditate, do something. Nah. So they, they've learned the sort of mental switch. You know, it's not here. It's it's somewhere else. They can go there and come back very quickly. Yeah. So one time we're driving and the remote viewer in, in question was driving. He was driving the car. And so I had a whole bunch of envelopes with, with hidden photographic targets. And I chose one at random. I didn't even know what was in it. And I said, okay, describe what's in this thing while he's driving. And the description was almost veridical. 
you know, so I, then I opened it up and said, well, holy crap, how did you know what was in this thing? And his response was, you know, you, you, you go to that place and there it is. Yeah. But as you say, for most of us, that's not maybe something intuitive right away. And we kind of have to no. stretch and flex our way into that skill or those yeah. abilities. Yeah. So part of practical magic then is exercises that if you do these and you have even a smidgen of talent, because some people don't, but most people have a smidgen of talent, they can learn tips and tricks to get up to the point where they become much better. Mm-hmm. But Everyone can play tennis a little bit, but not everybody's going to Wimbledon. Do you want to share one of these exercises, examples? or Well, the, the tips and tricks? You just, yeah, just one of those exercises you mentioned that you might add in there. Well, I, I will talk mainly about sigils. Mm-hmm. So the one of the sigils I talk about in Real Magic is that you, you take a blank sheet of paper and you simply, you suspend your disbelief and assume that the surface of the paper is the surface of reality itself. So anything that you write on it, you get a special pen. Like I, where's my special pen? I have a pen here. This is a pen, oh, this one. Yeah, I have a special pen. It's useful to have special paper, special pens, things like that. So this is a, a pen that has a rabbit on it. <laughs> Magical. So you take, you, yeah, it, it's a the, the rabbit in the hat. So then, so here's my special pen, which I would only use in doing writing magic. So you have your special piece of paper, you have something that you want to affirm that will, that's going to happen. And you write it very carefully. And while you're writing it, you're imagining that you are changing the surface of reality as a result of doing this. And you, you kind of maintain that as you're doing it. And it helps to have the focus on actually writing because that focuses the mind. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't need to take more than five, 10 minutes. And then you have a record of it. So the next step could be making a sigil out of it, but you don't even need to just get a, a book that you set aside as being your magic writing book. And that's all it's used for with your special pen, in my case, with a rabbit. This is, by the way, it's a Japanese pen. They have, they have a whole bunch of pens of little creatures coming out of them. Um, and then do that. And then start out with something that's simple enough so that you can see whether it worked like really simple, like I will walk outside and I'll find a coin, like a dime or a nickel just outside. Well, that oftentimes will happen because it could happen, right? You're not pushing all of the probabilities of the world around, you're adjusting internal perceptions Mm -hmm. and then things happen. Stretching yourself into believing it more and more and then adjusting it more and more. Yep. I love it. Thank you. So I divine that we were going to work together someday. Maybe I'm enchanting it. Who knows? We don't know what's going on. <laughs> but um, this has been so incredible. Uh, I just the work you've been doing in the space of magic is really groundbreaking. And it is, yeah, deeply appreciated. I, I hope that you you know this. So for those listening in, is there a place that they can find you or where can they go? Obviously, Real Magic, really recommend you pick that up. Is there a survey? Do you want us to opt in to be guinea pigs into your next study or <laughs> where do we find you? Well, so my personal website is deanraden.com. Mm-hmm. So I don't update it very often, but I do have most of the publications that I've done there, many of which you can get from the website. Um, the other, the, the research that we're doing is probably better to go to noetic.org, which is our, the Institute's website. And we have a section on uh, uh, experiences, some of which are research projects, some of which are other things like webinars and stuff that we give. We're uh, slowly becoming a virtual organization. So we have more and more things online. So we already mentioned that we're, we're collaborating with the people who make Muse mm-hmm. to do more and more citizen science. Uh, As I speak right now, we actually have one of a very, very few rare job openings for a research assistant in in our science department. So it's out there. Uh, So we also occasionally will list positions for people in different departments that we have, but uh, on, on our, on the Noetics website, and I put it on my Facebook page and LinkedIn and Twitter, where to go to see that advertisement. So I, I spoke to our, my boss the other day, actually earlier today, uh, our director of research, and she said that she put out that note 
today and already have a hundred applications. So there are a lot of people who want to do something in this domain. And this is one of those very rare opportunities where a job is available. Wow, very cool. So thank you so much, Mr. Dean Radin. It has been such a pleasure to have you on today's episode. Keep, uh, keep having these conversations, keep spreading this message, keep doing what you do. It's clear that you are very grounded in your creative core. The fact that you're able to withstand all the academic pushback and resilience is such a sign that you are, you know, aligned with your own sort of dharmic kind of cycle. So thank you for showing up and for, for being here on this episode with us. It's my pleasure. Take care, Dean. Bye. Okay. Bye.